Welcome to Forecast Lab. There will be some thunderstorm noises in the background, and that's pretty typical for this time of year. So let's get on with the forecast. As you can see, plenty of smoke up there in Quebec. They've had ongoing wildfires for at least a few weeks now. I think it started in Nova Scotia back in May, and eventually during the month of June, we picked up quite a few wildfires out there, especially north of Montreal. This is kind of an uninhabited area. Some of the fires have been pretty far north. A look at the climate indices show that things are fairly neutral. Very little to talk about. We are heading into El Nino, and the Manajulian oscillation is indeterminate, but it seems to be trending towards maybe phase one or phase two. There's a look at the surface analysis early this evening. That active Pacific system that we saw moving into the Great Basin area has stagnated in the central Rockies. We've got a fresh incursion of Canadian air coming out of the Dakotas and Montana, and that's producing even more rain in Montana. It's been a very, very wet season in that part of the country. Dry line extending from eastern Colorado down into the Lubbock area, down to about Sanderson and the Pecos River Valley. You can see those temperatures in that area are quite hot. Not as hot as what we had two or three days ago, but we are still above 110 or at 110 there at Catula and 105 to 108 elsewhere. And then looking at the moisture field, looking at dew points, those have fallen off a little bit. Back around the weekend, we had dew points up to 78 to 80 in East Texas, and that's been scoured out by these numerous thunderstorm clusters that have moved southeast, and we're down into the mid and low 70s. A little bit of weather in the East Coast region with that large upper level low hanging around the Appalachians, and with that, a weak frontal system there in Virginia and North Carolina. Numerous thunderstorm activity from the Carolinas down through Florida, as we would expect this time of year, and scattered showers up there in New York. Let's take a quick look up in Alaska, western Canada. It is warm. We're seeing 80s. In Alaska itself, seasonable temperatures, 70s, and we've got this stationary front through the interior. Some more cold air coming down from the Arctic ice pack. Temperatures are in the 30s out there around Banks Island and then heading eastward. Not much weather going on. Fairly quiet, a decaying system there in the Labrador Sea. And then we see that smoke there in Quebec and quite a bit of it extending all the way out towards Newfoundland. And yes, the tropical outlook. We've got Tropical Storm Brett, which has already crossed the Caribbean islands. Back on Wednesday, it was way out here. Currently, that's moving west at 18 knots. Only 50 miles an hour sustained on that. And trailing in its wake, Tropical Storm Cindy, 50 miles an hour. We're not expecting much with Brett. You can see that movement just basically due west. But Cindy is going to see some recurvature. However, it will stay a tropical storm. And we're going to pick this up on the GFS shortly. Just to give you a heads up, we're not expecting that to reach the East Coast. But you're going to see it on the forecast graphics here shortly. And that's going to be something for well into next week. Well, I figured I'd show you the spaghetti plot of all the different model forecasts on Cindy. And yeah, there is probably a slight risk of something reaching the East Coast because there's kind of a wide variation of different tracks. This is pretty far in the future. The models are really not that great forecasting beyond three to four days. So we're just going to play this by ear and see how things look on Monday. Hopefully we will see that recurvature but if not, we will continue to monitor that. Let's take a look at the 500 millibar heights and vorticity. This is in the mid-levels of the troposphere. Polar jet from California into the northern plains. And then arcing back down towards the southeast and then up the east coast. And there's another jet well up to the north. It's a split flow pattern. And we've got a subtropical high down in the Big Bend area, and that's one reason we're getting some hot temperatures there in Texas. So moving forward, we see these small-scale troughs 
progressing pretty rapidly, but there is a change in the long wave pattern. You can see this ridge here on Tuesday at the start of next week. It looks like it maybe retrogresses or we get a new ridge building out to the west, but you can see what happens. Ridge building on the west coast, so it is going to warm up there at the end of next week. And by the time we get into the first week of July, it looks like possibly a ridge out west and troughing out east. And that puts much of the country under a northwesterly flow. So this time of year, we look very carefully at moisture charts. This is the specific humidity chart, which is very similar to dew point. And this is up at one kilometer AGL. So it's about 3,000 feet above the ground. And we're not talking about sea level, we're talking about AGL. So even in Colorado, you're looking at here at the winds one kilometer above the ground. And we see swirls in here. And where you have these bullseyes, that indicates a circulation. So you look at the component of uh, which way it's turning. So we see a low pressure area up there in Ohio. And we see an anticyclone over Arkansas. We've also got a very large anticyclone across Bermuda extending into the Gulf, and that is the Bermuda High. You can see that it's feeding up the East Coast, kind of like that, and also feeding air into Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma. And we see a deformation zone right down here. You've probably seen this on weather charts and in certain weather books. It's that kind of pattern right there. And with those deformation zones, you have divergence along those two axes. And then you have convergence right there. And of course, convergence favors thunderstorm activity. And then right near the center of the deformation zone, it's indeterminate. So maybe not as much thunderstorm activity expected. Now that convergence zone does extend up into the plains. And it's kind of tied in with that Lisi trough right there in Colorado. Got those strong westerlies blowing across. We get that so-called ice skater effect going on. And we get the lower pressures right there, and we get that troughing. So a lot of convergent mechanisms there in the high plains. So what we also see is a lot of moisture. This is a blue color indicating 16, 18 grams per kilogram, which corresponds to low to mid-70s dew points at that level, which is very rich air. So let's see what happens over the weekend. A little bit of a decrease in moisture, but it looks like more of it is moving on shore. And then we get some of the daytime heating, which extends the boundary layer up to one kilometer. So more of it reappears right there. And then there's another burst right there again at 18Z on Sunday. So it does have kind of a diurnal cycle. And that's continuing to pump more and more moisture across much of the southeast U.S. and the Mississippi River Valley. You can see a front come down into the Red River region for Monday, so thunderstorm chances probably are going to continue. So wet pattern there for parts of the southern plains, and we get right back into that southerly flow for midweek, and then on the east coast, dry northwesterly flow coming from Canada. So this is kind of an interesting chart. This is the three kilometer moisture. So we're up a little bit higher and you can see that there's less moisture, but still it's a little bit rich there on the low plains, not as much depth across Tennessee, Alabama, and up into Illinois. So you can kind of visualize some of the variation in the tops of the moisture and we can also see an extension of this subtropical high up there. This is up at about 10,000 feet, maybe 11 or 12, somewhere in there. And we find this anticyclone over the weekend shifting into Texas and then moving eastward. Nope, it looks like it's stationary over. No, there it goes. Yeah, moving into Louisiana for Thursday. And that puts Texas under some very strong southerly flow, which is actually a little bit, bit more typical for summer, and that could spell the return of the sea breeze as that gets established. Here's another way we can look at the moisture. This is surface dew point. Yellow is 50s dew points, orange is 60s. 
and purple is 70s. And if you happen to see any red, that's going to be 80s, which is kind of a rare condition. A lot of moisture has made it into the high plains, and we've got upslope flow as well. Upslope flow is always a saturating type process because you get that adiabatic lift and that carries the rich moisture up to higher elevations and you get that humidification and maybe saturation and condensation. And that's what's happening there in Montana. During the wintertime, instead of thunderstorms, you might have stratus and fog. That was a rule that we used at Dias Air Force Base. Easterly flow was always risky for IFR and foggy conditions. So what we see here is lots of moisture on the Gulf Coast region, 70s making its way into Texas and Oklahoma, and right up there into the Great Plains. And you can kind of follow the changes. If you have a favorite area you want to keep track of, check that out. And you can see in the southwestern U.S., rather dry, these gray colors indicating 20s dew points. So the monsoon has not yet started. And we go forward into Sunday and Monday. There's some cool, dry air coming out of Canada. Lots of moisture remains in place in the southeastern U.S. And the pattern is a little bit stagnant. More moisture making its way into the high plains by midweek and into Minnesota for Thursday and Friday. Then we get another front working its way down into Kansas and Missouri for the end of the week. And it looks like some of that moisture is making its way into far west Texas. So this is going to be maybe the onset of the monsoon as that moisture tries to flood into the deserts. Yeah, you see that right there. All right, this is probably a good time to take a look at those temperatures. This is the forecast highs for today. And this is a slightly unusual chart. The shading that you're seeing here, like the reds and the oranges, those are not outlining the temperatures that you see right here. That's outlining something different. This is outlining the departure from typical highs. You see how you have 81 here and it's orange and 84 here and it's green? That's indicating that the 81 in Duluth is unusual, but the 84 at North Platte is a little bit on the cool side. So this quickly identifies from the shading where temperatures are above normal. And that happens to be from Minnesota down to Texas. And you notice that corresponds very closely to the upper level ridge. And we do have troughing out in the western part of the U.S. and that large upper level low across the eastern part of the U.S. So you kind of see how they're related to one another. Anyway, we were looking for 108 there at Midland today. The forecast for tomorrow, and this is from the National Digital Forecast data Database. So this is not model data. This is actually Weather Service human forecast numbers. So we're looking for 110 tomorrow at Midland. Sunday continues to be very warm in the Interstate 20 corridor of Texas. 110 to 104 between Midland and Fort Worth. For Monday, remains quite warm, especially San Antonio and Austin. And Tuesday, warm once again. But some very pleasant weather in Ohio. That would be really nice about now. And some cool conditions out in the western U.S. So things are not really changing very much. And there's how things look on Wednesday and for Thursday. So just not much change. A quick check of the radar before we leave. Some storms around the Longview-Tyler area down to Lufkin. Not very organized. You can see that they've laid down some outflow boundaries. And this is one thing that you want to track if you're forecasting because those are going to sit there overnight and they could become a focus for convection on the next day. Also seeing some disorganized storm activity from Snyder down to just west of San Angelo and into the Pecos River Valley. Most of these are along the dry line, and the storm here around Lubbock does look a little bit stronger, possibly some hail in that storm, and that's tracking down the highway towards Post. Some stronger storms in southeastern Colorado. 
This storm here near Coolidge has a tornado warning on it. Let me see if I can bring up the city names and roads. Well, those are already on there. Yeah, there we go. So that's going to be southeast of Lamar. This is tracking into the Syracuse, Kansas area. We've got this other cell along the Oklahoma-Colorado border. Fairly quiet today around Denver, but as we go north into Wyoming, we've got another confirmed tornado, and that's between Chugwater and Torrington. That definitely does look like a supercell, and that's tracking to the east-northeast. And the Rapid City radar picking up an MCS there in the desolate southeastern counties of Montana. One very strong isolated storm there north of Sturgis, and this tail end storm here has a tornado warning. That's going to be just southwest of Newcastle, Wyoming. And our final stop there in Florida, numerous cells from Melbourne up to Orlando and further up north into northern Florida. I don't know if we have any viewers there in Florida. If we do, please mention that in the comments. And I think that will be it for today, so we'll go ahead and close it up. And that's it for our Friday show. Thank you very much to our numerous supporters, people like Patrice Brown, Arthur Carlson, Jamie Singleton, Michael O'Neill, Fred Reamer, Jordan Wolf, Amos Yost. Thank you very much for helping to support the program. And as a reminder, I am going to be off for a quarterly break next week, and we'll return on the, I think it's going to be the 3rd of July. Yep, the 3rd of July for the supporters and the 5th for everybody else. Hope you have a great end of your June and great 4th of July weekend, and we'll see you back here soon. Take care. Bye-bye.